Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Extract. homelessness, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private property, capitalism. capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this episode, I am joined by the famed Marxist urban theorist, Andy Merrifield, to have a conversation about inter-urban competition, the social-spatial consequences of late neoliberalism, and the pervasive privatization of urban societies. Dr. Merrifield is a British independent scholar and one of the most prolific urban theorists writing today. He is the author of a dozen books and numerous articles, essays, and reviews in places like The Nation, Harper's Magazine, The New Left Review, Adbusters, The Guardian, Literary Hub, Brooklyn Rail, Radical Philosophy, Monthly Review, Jacobin, and Dissent. Dr. Merrifield has dedicated his life to teach and write about urbanism, social theory, and literature from a unique Marxist perspective. Amongst his many writings, he has published three intellectual biographies on Henri Lefebvre, Guy Debord, and John Berger. A widely popular existential manifesto for liberated living titled The Wisdom of Donkeys, a book about love and cities titled The Amateur, and a book inspired by the stories of Raymond Carver titled What We Talk About When We Talk About Cities and Love. His latest book, Marx Dead and Alive, was published by Monthly Review Press in November 2020. Dr. Merrifield is currently working on a book on beyond plague urbanism. Dear Andy, thank you very, very much for this conversation in Cities After. It is a true pleasure to be able to discuss with you about the effects that late neoliberalism has had in our urban societies. In my last podcast, which is, I think, number seven, I tried to explain inter-urban competition, which I believe is one of the key practical neoliberal dogmas that has determined urbanization today. However, there is hardly any mention of this in progressive politics, perhaps because it resonates as something too abstract and non-local. Uh, but there is no doubt that acting or talking small-scale change or issues on hyperlocality is much more accessible and attractive to activists than trying to counter inter-urban competitiveness. Nevertheless, it is a fact that the economic, political, and material production of our cities has been totally outsourced uh, way beyond any local democratic control. These for the purpose of private surplus absorption, in which the creation and sustain of, of a competitive climate has been absolutely key. So Andy, in an article that you recently published in the Monthly Review, titled uh, Lefebvre uh, in the Age of COVID, you wrote the following, and I quote, The public state has been hollowed out to such a degree that it's shoddy. It seems perfectly natural these days to see the public sector core functions, such as planning and the organization of collective services, outsourced for vast sums to distant private consultants and contractors. But COVID has exposed the shortcomings of the privatized state. End of quote. Would you mind elaborating in which ways has COVID exposed the shortcomings of the privatized state and its outsource to global consultants and capital? How does interurban competition play a role in all of this? Ooh. Hi, Miguel. It's, it's, it's very nice to be, to be here, to be talking to you uh, and to be invited to your podcast, which I've been, I've been listening to uh, thus far. Um, that's a tough question. I, I wrote that piece for Month Review a couple of months ago, and uh, a lot of it was around the, the 50th anniversary of Lefebvre's The Urban Revolution. And also it was around the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune, which has received a lot of uh, attention, I think, from, from left people justifiably. Uh, and I just wanted to, to, to think about those 
into works, the, the urban revolution and the kinds of ideas that Lefebvre was espousing there in the context of the, the Paris Commune and for some degree, you know, 71 days when Paris became a, a zone of people power and, you know, communal power and they, be, they became themselves a, a, the, the urban municipality for, for a short while. And just, you know, what, what we could learn from that. Um, but in terms of just, just you know, what was going on with COVID and some of the, the, the antics that I've seen around in the United States and in the UK is that it just struck me that a lot of the, the problems that one has anticipated with trying to deal with a pandemic is, was, was always in some ways, you know, really kind of exposed by Margaret Thatcher's famous dictum from 1979. 1980 that there's no such thing as society only individuals and families you know and since then we've had an ethos of a form of possessive individualism all the kinds of things the, the the public sector is the problem the private sector is you know it's the panacea to it all we need to do is get make life a bit more entrepreneurial and with the state is full of the dead weight of you know a, a behemoth of a bureaucracy that's just you know really in, in in some ways inefficient and it can't deal with social problems and in fact you know there's no such thing as social problems anymore individuals and families can sort it out and then you know several decades later we see the result of what's been happening you know in the 1980s in, in the us and in britain we saw the state just begin to close down its its public works you know uh planning departments were just ripped apart Yes. Uh, all, all forms of, of what, what was seen to be done in house by the state that were used by, by public paid public employees that were accountable in some shape or form to the particular party that, that was in control of the, either the city or the nation state. And, and all, those, all those agents of the state were accountable to an electorate that had voted them in power. And you had some form of transparency about what they were doing and what was being used with the public money so when taxpayers paid you know you had a sense that they were emptying the garbage or they were dealing with some of the the the, the problems of, of of planning a city and you you kind of knew who was doing it you know and uh, you knew who was pulling the purse strings you had some accountability and i'm not suggesting there weren't any problems with that of course there were problems with that uh, the problems emerged in, in the 1970s with particular forms of fiscal crisis of the state, that the state was spending more money than it was receiving. And then with the whole kind of oil crisis in 73, things went belly up and prices were inflated. And we, we, saw, we saw that, that phase of post-war capitalism, Keynesian welfare state capitalism begin to begin to collapse. And yes. so the, the problem is of the state being hollowed out has been ongoing for decades. But those services still had to be achieved. So, you know, who was who was who was achieving them? Well, a lot of the time the state then began to realize that actually they still needed their bins emptying, garbage collected. They still need somebody to service the IT of all the computerization that were going on in the municipality. They still needed to have some form of planning and agencies there that regulated what was going on in society. So who was going to do it if, if, if these agencies, had, you know, within the state themselves, the in-house agencies had been closed down? Yes. And then they had this, this idea that, well, if, you, if we tendered subcontraction, you know, if we tendered um, contracts for various subcontractors, they could compete with one another about who could offer the best deal to empty the garbage. And, and then we can decide which contractor we want to employ then we can save money and we can improve the services. I mean, that's, that was the, in a, in a very yes, simplified and, and, form. And somehow push the competitiveness between these contractors. No? I remember very well um, you know, the, reading a lot about the period in, in London, especially as, as Thatcher was beginning to test a lot of these uh, sort of privatized urban strategies in, um, in the Docklands, right? Sometimes I refer to that period as perhaps the, the, the first test of neoliberalization of, of cities, um, at least in the in the what they would call the developed world. I mean, we know that that Santiago 
you know, with Pinochet was perhaps, uh, you know, an even earlier test, you know, began. But what the Docklands started to do was precisely that, right? It, it was starting to put at the service of of uh, of the private industry, the production of the city. And as you say, it was something that used to happen or used to be uh, uh, part of the things that uh, state agencies would do, right? Sure, it was a, sure. a very, very strong transition that happened there. Sometimes I actually argue that, that Thatcher and, and her teams uh, were perhaps the most interesting uh, urbanist in the last 40 years, right? Uh, not because they produced something we like, but because they knew what they were doing. Uh, and they managed to change the yeah. whole landscape completely. Yeah, they managed to transform the whole ideology of what, it, what constituted urban regeneration. You know, once in a while, there was money that was used to ge- regenerate public facilities. Suddenly, we had the bright idea that actually we'll use public money to regenerate private enterprise in the city. So the whole emphasis, you know, this was a deep ideological shift as well. And I think that's what's so important. And that's what makes it so entrenched. And that's what makes it, that's what made it very recently seem perfectly normal that if you're going to have a sort of contract and trace system for, for COVID that was need to be managed some way that was, was involving, you know, a, a pandemic that was nationwide, I'm talking here about the UK, then we needed somebody that, that could do it. And you think, well, who can do it? We have no state agency that does it. So why yeah. don't we just get McKinsey to sort it out for us? Because, you know, McKinsey are these this global management Consultancy yeah, and it was the same that, thing in New York knows State. knows what they're doing. Yeah. And it's the same in France. It was the same with Macron. They did it in France. They've done it in the US. And of course, McKinsey just haven't got a clue either, you know. And so they spend millions and millions and millions. And, and McKinsey's, as you know, better than I do, Miguel, they're involved globally on projects where the, the, all of these projects seem to fail at great expense, you know, local governments, uh, private enterprise, public bodies, pay McKinsey vast amount of money to come in to sort things out. And usually they kind of mess it up. And, yes. you know, they and charge the reports a great deal. are mostly trash. Yeah. They, they, yeah, and the reports they do, occasionally they're, 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 they're decent things they do, but by and large, you know, they, they talk about things they really don't have any expertise in, even though they're called sort of experts. And uh, this, is, this has been, been the problem, but, but the ideological shift was rooted in really in the 19 late 70s early 80s and up until the 90s so when you know the pandemic struck it was it was the, it was really the first time that i think we've had we've had financial crises and we've seen the state bail out the banks we've seen we've seen we've seen the, the public realm come to the the aid of of, of the of, of private private failure for many many years and many many occasions obviously the latest was was you know 2008 yeah but since then you know we've never really it's it's never those those things have loomed large in life you know housing foreclosures various dispossessions of houses you know that the, the whole kind of job loss the whole stripping down as has, has happened of, with, through austerity we've seen all those, but by and large, it's never really bitten into people's daily life on that immediate level. But with the pandemic, it, it really, it really did. And, mm-hmm. and so this was the first time we've we've seen that there was nothing left of the state, be it yeah. the municipality at the at the local level or the nation state. There was nothing there that could. There were no in-house thoughtware, no in-house hardware that could deal with a, a problem that was so far-reaching and so societal and that was all i w- was was saying there that this 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 has been a an ongoing problem that has reached an ideological normacy with people uh, a lot of people who won't be old enough to have any historical memory of what was going on in the 1970s and it's yes. not being nostalgic about what went on then because there were serious problems with the state with the public realm it's more the idea that actually there, 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 were, there, were, there were mechanisms that were involved that had some semblance of democracy. They were intervening in daily life 
in and the, for in, public in, benefit, and right? For, and uh, for, well, for seemingly public for benefit. Pub yeah, yeah. For, uh, there were people for, arguing for it for yeah. pub, for public benefit, and you, you kind of knew what was going on. So when you when you hear about all the cronyism that's going on, the cronyism has always gone on. Of course, it's always gone on. Boss politics, you know, it's notorious. It's notorious in the U.S. under that rubric, and it's it's always been going on here too. I'm not naive to believe that the corruption of of public politicians and public representatives, but there, there was there was a semblance of of some some public knowledge and some public transparency, and there were there were mechanisms whereby you could kind of trace the the shifts of money and what was going on, and there were it, it seems like all those all those um, checks and balances have just been wiped away, and we've we're just left now with a with with a with a, a private private solutions to what are really de desperate, desperately important public matters. And it's clear that it, a lot of what they have and what they do is not fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, and the, one of the big stumbling blocks is, 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 to, is to sort of expose that and to try and address this deep, deep, deep ideological uh, this deep ideological belief that somehow the public is is, is problematic and shoddy and, and and second rate and the the private sector is is gleaming and has all the ent entrepreneurial and innovative ideas when clearly that's just you know it's just not the case it's just not no the and, case. and then even more telling today Andy is that um or, or I guess more urgent or more more uh, critical is that the period that we started to talk about, you know, when Thatcher started to take, you know, more into issues into the private realm, um, the, the UK was still dealing with a, with an, uh, with its own national sort of like rearrangement, you know, as the 1980s went by and then 1990s went by when Finally, through Blair and through Clinton and so on, the global economy started to push, right? Uh, not only by Margaret Thatcher's sort of push, but also by the signing of all these multilateral agreements, right? From Mercosur to the NAFTA to the creation of the European Union, which by now we all can see it as a, as a free trade area or not a free trade area, but as a, as a commerce treaty, right? Between different European states more than anything else. And so you saw or we have seen the gradual increase of privatization going from the from the nation state, right, all the way into a global condition, which is impossible to partake into any form of democracy, right? Because yeah, yeah. the global sort of uh, supranational organizations, supranational institutions, uh, we don't vote for them. Right, their their IMFs and their McKinseys and their uh, you know even the UN to a certain extent plays the UN habitat plays that role, you know? right? And so um, we we are right now in a, at a specific stage where the internationalization, the globalization of privatization, right, vis-a-vis -vis urban environments is so distant. Where does the city citizen stand, right, in relationship to those that are taking decisions at a direct international level? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question, Miguel. Yeah. It's a good question. It is the question. It, it's 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 a curious phenomenon, isn't it? When you think of, uh, you know, you do get the sense. I mean, I came of age in the nineteen seventies. I was twenty in nineteen eighty, and I remember Margaret Thatcher coming to power in when I was nineteen. So I remember the nineteen eighties very well. And it, it, it's it's curious because she, you know, the. She honestly did believe this was this was this was going to work. You know, she honestly believed that people who rented their houses, if they bought their houses, that they you could create what she called a property owning democracy. That private property was, you know, was was the key to some. It it, it gave you some form of freedom, uh, and 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 that word freedom is is the key word I think yeah. in this because yeah. it's branded about all the time. And I have to say. From from being somebody who's throughout my intellectual career has has espoused freedom. When I hear the freedom ever mentioned and on the airways or in media and anywhere now, it just makes me wince because I just know it. it I just know it's used as an ideological foil to for selfishness for uh, for people just to do what they want without having any 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 constraints to to what they want. So it's all very well, you know, if you if you do if you're benefiting from this this top dog system, 
um, this top dog system, you know, the, the, you can you'll be quite happily peddling your own freedom to choose to consume the, your own free trade, your own free will. You have it, but actually, mm-hmm. if you don't, the vast majority of people, then you, you've 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 had it. You know, you you don't you don't have any particular kind of rights. You don't have any any particular kind of liberty. Yet, for somehow, you you believe that you do. And through through consumption, it, yes. It, it, it's it's through 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 consumption. So it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a strange it's a strange it's been a strange phenomenon how that has caught hold and how what Thatcher believed was would, would create a certain democracy has been exported globally and it is a global orthodoxy as you've said that the, the whole notion of privatization is a global orthodoxy yes. uh, and it, it comes with this this ideology of freedom that is seen to be anything that isn't that it's something that isn't about the private the private Opening enterprise markets yes. isn't about market market solutions isn't about you know the power of money to to somehow resolve any issues that that is taking away one's liberty it's it's creating a nanny state it's creating a, you know it's 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 creating a a very repressive socialist kind of socialist ideology that is against individual liberty and it's it's a very hard it's a very difficult ideology to to um contest and to and to and to try and offer a solution that isn't based on that that there are plenty of other ideas that you could come up with that aren't just necessarily market based but they don't get a look in and uh, you know the ideological reach of of questions of freedom you know we saw this in the the, the most idiotic absurd uh, scale the, the absurd example of it with mask wearing that you know in a yeah. global pandemic to protect other people you know put a mask on well if i put a mask on it's you know it's taking away my individual liberty we, you know and people ripping a mask obviously the trump's us was the you know was the nadir of that in terms of what was going on and and you know how could we have reached that point is 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 for somebody who's been looking at these things for several decades is, is very very troubling and it's so and very interesting disturbing. That, that most most of these these um sort of symbols of freedom uh, end up being material symbols or symbols of of of, of uh of certain consumption sort of uh, parameters. I mean, I, it reminded a bit of a uh, Guy Debord saying, you know, that in the future or like in current capitalism, uh, all social relations are mediated through commodities. Yeah. Even the issue of the mask becomes politicized in terms of social relations, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever it is, you know, in terms of, um, of a co- commodity. I mean, if we talk also about Lefebvre, uh, you know, arguing uh, urban space is a very special commodity, right? Yeah. Um, which uh, you start to create or to to think about urban space in this politicized issue in which social relationships are produced, and urban space becomes also that, right? Uh, together with all of these elements that somehow encapsulate the image of freedom. I mean, urban consumption versus, you know, inhab proper inhabitation as, uh, as uh, you know, or unification, as Lefebvre would say. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I, you know, Guy de Boer, The Society of the Spectacle is is, is one of my favorite books. And uh, when, when you read it today, it, it's quite hard to get past thesis number one. I mean, you know, Miguel, it's 221 theses. And the first thesis says something like, you know, all that was once directly lived has moved away into a representation. Yes. And you think all it was once directly lived has moved away into a representation. What, representation of what? Well, representation of, you know, you read Marx. Marx talks about value. The representation of value is, 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 is money. Money becomes the ultimate, becomes one form of representation. Money values. So money values is one representation. And then you get, you know, the other, the other notion is the, what is a representation of truth? Well, the only representation of truth is what McKinsey tell you and what some of the, the big global management corporations tell you or what the Wall Street Journal tells you. So that's another way in which representation has, has taken over and become this representation of truth. You know, it's a, it's a kind of expert view, experts who are not really experts. And then the other representation that Guy Debord is on about is, you know, representation of democracy. You know, whilst it's clear that we participate with democracies like the Paris Commune, for example, do have certain 
you know, there are certain shortcomings. You know, we need some mix of representative democracy and some form of participatory democracy, whereby citizens feel that their representatives aren't representing money values or representing the the, the truth of uh, as yeah. as as voiced by McKinsey, but it's they're, they're voicing other other truths and other uh, other um, other realities that that are there, and you know so. This idea of representative democracy is, is is also really doesn't have any legitimacy. It, it's been it's become another representation. It's another it's another spectacle. It's yeah. either yeah. Donald Trump or it's Boris Johnson. It's it's, it's the cult of personality and it, it, it's or a material it, thing. The mask, as you or, say, or the oh, yeah. or the material thing. And it's 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 a it's it's a terrible issue to that needs to be addressed and um, how it can be addressed. I, yeah. you know is, is yeah no that that part that part of how could be addressed it's it's a uh, i mean it's a big question i mean we were arguing even before or talking before the podcast you know about uh, you know how strange are times today and how we don't see uh, directions forward but one thing that i have seen especially from younger generations is that Uh, all the issues from the left and from the right, right? The issues of, of global um, directives are, are not being taken so much into account. And we've seen an uprise of uh, collective organizations more at a neighborhood level. So it's almost like yeah. an anti-global or anti-globalization movement, which also um, uh, kind of destroys the, the, the questions of, uh, you know, global competitiveness, perhaps, right? Uh, uh, perhaps the uh, Wall Street will continue doing this global competitive things but in terms of the local uh, urban units they're they're starting to look more into themselves right um, there's uh, been a trend on municipalism for example um, uh, right now I'm in Barcelona and uh, the yeah. current uh, go municipal government has been pushing agendas that are municipalist agendas somehow counteracting um, the the questions or that uh, or the directives that were put in the previous decades in the previous years, so th there is something there, and I wonder if uh, what are your views? I mean, how can you discuss uh, these sort of I guess contradictions that appear? Right on one hand, Wall Street pushing more. Um, the internationalist and globalist e issues or the, 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 the global economy, as they say, but the local economy functioning or starting to, to figure out this functioning differently. Yeah. Well, I suppose in terms of my own feeling is that if, if, it's, if it's something that is, that, is, um, that is seeing to maybe promote some form of local democracy, whilst the localism could be problematic, it may not necessarily always be problematic. And just the same way in which I suppose the neoliberal project started out, but it wasn't necessarily something that began in particular places and then seemed to get exported. So I don't know, it, it could be naive to think, but I think anything that maybe goes against the grain is starting to think about um, how the public realm, particularly the accountable public realm at the municipal level might actually come up with some ideas about what to do with all the empty vacant office space that's, that's around to think about what they might do in response to some of the sort of climate change issues uh, in, in, in terms of emission, you know, things like emission, um, emission laws and emission regulation is, you know, the, the city of London and, and under Sadiq Khan is doing quite well in that, in that respect. Um, so there are some local local issues that might involve the local state, might involve local protagonists, might involve local groups, but the kinds of ideas that they're trying to conceive may not necessarily be those ideas where they see that the private sector is the solution. So it could be, you know, maybe it, is, sure. it could be seed beds. It could be some way of yes. showing, demonstrating little paradigms of possibility that those paradigms of possibility might, begin to send begin to give ideas elsewhere and if you you know we do have urban networks that go on i'm not just, i'm not just talking about the the the, the, net, the alliance the, with the paris accord cities and climate change initiatives but you know that there are networks of that bent that could begin to share ideas and to discover possibilities but it but it, it it does it does need a combination of things i think miguel you know that, that 
it, it's clear that that the the business as usual pre COVID nineteen those kind of conditions have to stop. There has to be some some epistemological break as well as yes, an ontological rupturing here. There has to be some the business as usual as we've had it prior to you know January whatever twenty 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 has to has to begin to to, to, to stop so that the, the buck the buck should stop there but to fill the void you know there's there's all different categories we need there's a void of political will there's a void of political courage there's, there's a void of representative democracy that people feel that you know they want to bestow their representative interests to various politicians that there needs to be somebody that can go out on a limb and can you know, can actually have a conviction about something that might be about, again, defending the public realm, that might be progressive. And we could start at the city level and we could intervene in the urban land markets to think, okay, so we have, you know, 40% vacant properties in, in central London. Sadiq Khan has some powers to restrict traffic emissions and, and, and congestion charges through various taxes to loosen some of the the pollution in central london but he doesn't have any power to try and regulate and control property markets but yes. you know is there is is there some political will political politicians that are being pressed and pressured by a social movement that can make them that can bolster their courage to act to try and suggest that you know there's 40 percent empty property here glass and steel in a city that's 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 laying empty is are there any ways in which we can rezone it is are there any ways we can encourage local architects to come and intervene and rehab some of these properties rehab yeah. these properties for affordable housing affordable housing for young people but affordable housing for families with people with kids who can no longer you know afford the city yeah, you know, or even right up, to, uh, opening them up to public space uh, 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 and public opening use. Opening them up yeah. to, to various, opening up to some kind of competition, yeah. but but involving, you know, not not involving the usual global multinational suspects, but involving some 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 real and, and that is the local, sad part, Andy, because that yeah. seems to be the direction uh, post-pandemic situations are taking. I mean, you mentioned the McKinsey stuff, you mentioned all that. That is yeah. uh, what I have been seeing, right? Even yeah. though the social movements are. Um, are are pushing very hard. I mean, there's social movements around the world that are pushing very sure, hard. Sure. And and there are precedents. I mean, uh, of course, it was a very different situation. Uh, but you know, the the, the Vanderbilts won once once the, the the richest man in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, um, got expropriated. Um, you know, uh, in many many sort of parts of his business, especially transportation, train business, in order to make uh, stations and train uh, stations public and so forth, right? And this was the most power one of the most powerful people in the in the planet right that, yeah. that we're doing it. so uh, i'm different scenarios but the, the the situation of crisis right now seems to be even more dire with uh, climate change uh with the coming of artificial intelligence with a post-pandemic scenario the incredible wealth gap that has you know that is always bringing i always bring these topics into the podcast right when i ask the the last question which cheer, is not last question the last, <laughs> yeah to cheer you up when i ask this last thing to my guest is what is um how do you see from a very positive scenario from a utopian scenario the next five years what would be your ideal Ugh. sort of step through changes that need yeah. to be you know persistent yeah. direction? super hard question i mean there's, there's two ways you can look at it. well there's several ways you can look at it miguel i suppose if you wanted to be optimistic then you can have a long range view you can think you can think in long waves and if you look past if you look back at past pandemics going back to going back to ancient greece you know if you read uh, um if, if looking at uh, if you're looking at some of the stuff that pandemics that went on ancient Greece under Pericletus, you know Pericles, I should say, then then you know the cholera epidemics and the Black Plague, and it plagued us throughout the Middle Ages. And you can read Daniel Defoe's book on plague in London, you know, from yeah. from from hundreds of years ago, sort of 17th century. Then um, it, it, it's there's a sense long wave is that humanity has adapted has dealt with it in some ways. The species hasn't been 
been killed off. We've managed to withstand it. We've managed to readapt. And historically, too, you know, one of the one of the things looking at is it's actually sparked usually some form of inter interventionary politics, interventionary projects that involved infrastructure. You know, I know infrastructure is a big just a big buzzword in the US right now. And I just mm -hmm. signed a bill to Biden to try and sort out the crumbling sort of infrastructure in the US. So public infrastructure has always been one of the solutions, you know, whether it be waterborne diseases through through cholera, uh, you know, sanitation, sanitation, and you can read Lewis Mumford's city in history to get a good, a good long wave view on that is that humanity has has adjusted and survived and actually th thrived after crises and after pan global pandemics through various forms of interventionary public infrastructure. If you wanted to maybe think about it optimistically, then having a long range view is, is, is one. But I suppose as you know, Keynes used to famously say in the long run, we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be dead. What about in the meantime? Yes. It's, it's, it's the meantime that's the, is, is, the, is the more troubling one. It's, it's the idea that what can happen in the meantime, what can we do to uh, try and somehow address this ideological hegemony of the private? Uh, there are lots of little things that can be done. Um, as, I guess that you, you need to, you need to understand who your friends are in this day and age that whilst whilst the private sector might be the bad guys that there actually could be some good guys within the private sector too and how can you leverage some of that it's unavoidable in terms of um what goes on yeah. the two issues there are, are the political will is a is a local political will to intervene that if you can get initiatives that can be launched and you can get politicians that can be pressured into in some way um, using public money public coffers again in responsible use value ways rather than just giving it away to promote exchange values then the the, the the political dilemma and the political will has to be has to be always in, in some way pressured to do the right thing in one of my pieces I wrote about this idea of a living rent now by living rent, I don't just mean rent controlled housing for, for, for individuals and families. I mean, is there any way that one can control the commercial rents to try and promote more in the vacant spaces, try to promote more local, more independent stores? And of course, you know, this, this, this is, we're still talking about capitalism. We're almost talking about Proudhon here, sort of artisanal capitalism. But I, I do think it, it's a step in 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 the, yeah. in the right direction, and yeah. it, it 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 has you know you have to know what your friends are, and I think that having a local bakery with the you know okay it may be catering for a middle class richer clientele initially, but it's surely better than some you know multinational chain you know that that's just kind of colonizing the city and is is not actually treating its workers very well either. That there has to be some way in which. We can gradually we yeah, move we, I, I, into... I just don't, I, I, I'm not suggesting that this is some, just some form of, uh, of, of, of has to be utterly localized or, or even that it's depoliticized. The whole political, the whole political impetus, the whole question of struggling in the city, various groups struggling, struggling against ideological contamination, struggling against trying to correct some form of ideological propaganda always very difficult of course when we know the media is controlled by such big forces but developing other media developing other ways in which they can disseminate information counter information correcting bias disseminating real truth acting on it together collectively involving certain kind of projects that people in low in, in, in the authorities can kind of cultivate nurture and there can be a symbiosis where that can foster some ideas it doesn't necessarily have to be anything utopian and we need something that involves an normal you know some some imagination it has an imaginative drive to it that can recreate certain um spaces in cities in these that can fill these spaces of emptiness with various forms of spaces that can transform the city to play, make them ones of, of of kind of encounters 
the can, how, how how can you yeah how yeah, can you the begin the famous to, thing of uh, Lefebvre uh, which we would say is difference difference yeah, right yeah that's that can uh, bring difference again into the urban realm yeah right? how how can we how is it is it possible how can you plan for spontaneity is what Lefebvre says is is it yeah. is spontaneity in the city is some form of improvisation is some form of adventure is it, is it something that can be cultivated yeah. by planners? So perhaps uh, doing away or rebelling against the things that uh, that somehow have eliminated the possibility of spontaneity in the city. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and familiarity. Yeah. One, one of the terrible things is that is is you know I I always say that uh, the you know the the banality of the city is 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 is, is the, is full of the only the things that money can buy. When you invest in a city and you you invest in money, you destroy certain aspects of city uh, that perhaps once were a little bit more grungy and more spontaneous and a little bit more um, darker. And you, you you clean it up. You get some big chains involved. You you know you. You, you get the high street chains and then you get the, the boutique chains and then you get the super, super boutique chains. And, the and whole, then there's the super boutique people. Uh, and, and then those. you get the super and you get the same familiar people, the familiar, the familiar enterprises, the familiar faces, the familiar banks, the familiar accountancies, the familiar chains, the familiar, you know, the familiar kinds of housing that goes with it, the familiar coffee bars. Everything just becomes flattened with familiarity, no matter how many skyscrapers get built. You know, there's, there's a, the, the best way to destroy a city is through glass and steel and build an office space. It, it's, a, it, it's a sure way in which you can yeah. kind of destroy with life. A completely familiar and normalized sort absolutely. of corporate culture. Yes, it could, it's a nausea. It's a fantastic way of, of, of ending the podcast because uh, in if you remember in the in the previous podcast, uh, I was talking about the nauseating effect of designer everything in cities, no? uh, and that how everything looks alike. And somehow yeah. that has been the ultimate material effect of the familiarity of this interurban competition under neoliberalism. I want to thank you, Andy, uh, for this fantastic uh, conversation. And I hope that you can join uh, in future episodes, you know, as we discuss more, more things about uh, the city and today and what comes well, out. Well, thank, thank you for asking me, Miguel. Great pleasure always. Thank you. It's lovely to have you. Thank you, Andy. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.